Well, good morning and welcome to the Conquerors class at Worth Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas. We're glad you're with us this morning. Hope everybody's doing well. Uh, hope everybody's staying safe. Uh, we want to get started quickly this morning. I have a lot to cover, so I'm going to read our prayer requests out and then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. I want to remember this morning those that are sick and still dealing with the virus, those that are hospitalized, those that have lost loved ones. Also, I want to continue to remember our first responders and uh, doctors, nurses, the hospital personnel, people who deal directly with the virus. We also want to continue to lift up our policemen as we go through these troubled times in our major cities and around our country. Uh, please pray for our policemen. Uh, please pray that they don't all quit. Uh, we also want to remember this time uh, school's about to start. It looks like it is going to start, uh, possibly start online, but then progress back to the classroom. So I want to pray for our Sunday school teachers, the administrators, the school workers, that uh, they'll be kept safe during this time. I want to also continue to lift up our uh, leaders of our country, our president, vice president, our congressmen, and governors and mayors, those that are making decisions, they need God's wisdom. Uh, our prayer would be that they would seek God's wisdom as they make decisions. We know that they're not all saved, so that's something else. We need to be praying for the salvation of our leaders. Uh, let's don't leave them out. We're uh, admonished in God's Word to pray for our leaders, respect our leaders, obey our leaders. Let's uh, continue to lift up those in our church that are sick. We, On our prayer list, we now have some people who uh, have the virus, some who are getting over the virus, some who have other illnesses and things they're dealing with. Our cancer patients, as always, Ms. Hawkins and Brother Casey. Uh, we want to continue to lift up Judy as she's lost her daughter this past week or so, that uh, the Lord would be an encouragement to her. We want to continue to pray for each other. Uh, it's very needed during this time. That's what we're going to talk a little bit about this morning is prayer. Uh, I hope you have a prayer list. If you don't, I'd encourage you to get a prayer list. Something that you can refer to each day as you go to the Lord in prayer. That way we don't leave out those important things and important people that we're supposed to pray for. So let's take just a few minutes and uh, go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him for guidance and wisdom and lift these people up that we've mentioned. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come to you in prayer. What a privilege it is that we can bring our burdens and petitions to you each day, all during the day, Lord, that you hear our prayer and you answer our prayers. We thank you, Lord, what a privilege it is that you've given us. It's one of the resources that we have at our disposal and we should take advantage of it. We do lift up to you those that have been mentioned this morning. We ask you, Lord, to work in each heart, each life, each situation. Our prayer, Lord, is that you would end this virus, that we would be able to get back to normal in our daily lives, that you would end the rioting and uh, the things that are causing turmoil in our country, around our cities. And Father, we know that uh, we have a part in this. and. I pray that as we look into your word this morning that you'll show us what our part is and that we will uh, vigorously begin to pray to you, Lord, uh, knowing that you're the one who answers prayer. You are the one alone who answers our prayers, and we thank you for that. We also lift up to you today our pastors, our staff, all their families, Lord. Give Pastor wisdom as he leads us, give him power as he preaches to us. We pray for Brother Weavers. He begins a series this coming week to uh, teach us about judging and things like that in our lives. So, Lord, we thank you for our church home. What a blessing it is to be a member of Worth Baptist Church, a member of the body. And we're thankful for it. We pray you continue to bless our church, bless our members, bless the ministries and the workers. And Lord, we need more workers. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us. Thank you for what you're going to do for us. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So I hear one of my cats roaming around. If you hear a meow, or if Bubba comes in, it'll be a wow. So uh, just let that go past you. We want to look today in God's Word, the first scripture we want to look at. We're going to look at two stories in the Bible today. So we're going to have a good bit of scripture. So I want you to open your Bibles, get your notepads out. Turn first to Acts chapter 12, the book of Acts chapter 12. We're going to look at a familiar story, and we're going to see uh, how prayer plays an important part in it. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 12. I'm going to read the first 19 verses, so pay attention here. The Bible says, Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison, and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him. And wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but he thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken, named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in, and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Now, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the sto soldiers what was become of Peter. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode. So we have here... Uh, Peter, who's been taken and put in prison, Herod has killed James, and it pleased the Jews so much, the leaders, that he decided, oh, I'll, I'll go even better. I'll put Peter in prison, and as soon as Passover is done, I'll kill him too. And so we pick up the story, and Peter's in prison, but if you'll notice, uh, the Christians were gathered at Mary's house. Back in this time, it was... Uh, something that they did constantly. They gathered together for prayer meetings and they did it in houses. And it was something that happened all the time. This wasn't so much a special prayer meeting, but once it was known that Peter was in prison, then it became special to them. And I think verse 5 kind of sums up. Let's go back to verse 5 for just a minute. It says, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church 
unto God for him. Since it was uh, a fact that Peter had been put in jail, they more or less dedicated this time of prayer to Peter. Pray, excuse me, to Peter. And uh, it says that they prayed without ceasing. They prayed fervently with compassion and uh, didn't stop. It was important to them. Uh, you know, we have prayer meetings on Wednesday night, and then we have a special uh, prayer the first Saturday night of the uh, month at church. And uh, there's very little attendance at it, I'll be honest with you. And uh, I'm one of the ones who a lot of times can't get there. But prayer meetings are important. I wonder how much importance do we place on prayer meetings? Do you make a special effort to be at Wednesday night prayer meeting? And sometimes I wish we could spend more time in prayer than we do. And for sure, each of us can spend more time in prayer. We can even have meetings on our own. We can, there's nothing wrong with us gathering together, a few of us together at someone's house and praying for special things. This would be an excellent time to do that. Some of the things that are going on need special prayer. So as Peter was in jail, it goes through the things that happened now. Peter was being held uh, by uh, quite a number of soldiers. There were two that were chained to him, and then two that were on the uh, doors right outside. So there were four people and they're in tours. There was four each time. So there were 16 that were uh, holding him overall, and there was no way for him to get out. God had to do it. And as Peter was there praying, you know, uh, the people that were praying knew there was nothing they could do to go in there and grab Peter and bring him out. But they could pray. And that's the way we need to look at this situation today. Maybe we're not in a position to actually go out and do something uh, to help overcome this virus. Maybe it's other people, but we can pray. Uh, maybe there's nothing that we're going to be involved in in these uh, riots that we're having, but we can pray. And we should be doing it. That's our part. Some people are the ones who will go out there and face the crowds. Some people are the ones who are the uh, personnel that deal directly with the virus. And then there's the rest of us. We have a part too. We should be praying just like Peter. Uh, uh, didn't have anything he could do at the time, but there were people in intercessory prayer. That can be our part as intercessors praying for the situations and things that are going on. So as we look at Peter, you know, he thought he was having a dream. And then as he got outside, uh, he finally realized, no, I'm free. This wasn't a dream. This was God that did this. God still answers prayers. God still does miraculous things. We need to do our part. And as Peter went and he went to Mary's house where he knew there would be a gathering, because they did it on a timely basis. Uh, he knocked on the door. I think it's uh, really funny that the young lady who went to the door and she heard Peter's voice, but she didn't open the door. She was so excited that she ran back to the prayer meeting and said, It's Peter. Peter's here. Peter's here. And they said, No, no. Uh, it can't be. Peter's in prison. Maybe it's his angel. But finally they go and open the door and Peter comes in and when they see him then they believe you know seeing is believing uh, blessed are those who've never seen Jesus yet still believe in him and believe in the gospel we still need to believe that Jesus works miracles we still need to believe that our prayers mean something our prayers can be part of a greater answer that God gives so we need not to uh, diminish our part in this. Uh, we want to see change in our country now. If there's ever been a time when there needs to be a change, it's now. America needs to wake up. We need to turn back to where we were, to where our forefathers uh, were when they set up our Constitution and our country. Second uh, Chronicles 7.14 if my people, he's talking basically to the Jews back then, but now we are part of his people. If my people, if Christians, 
will turn from their wicked ways. Yes, we have wicked ways. We have wicked things going on in our country now. A lot of it's due to the fact that Christians didn't stand up, didn't speak up when the time was there for them to do it. But now we can still make a difference. We can turn back to where we're supposed to be. Uh, many times we see in God's Word where the people were called to repent, to turn back. Our second story we're going to look at, uh, you can be turning there. Uh, we're just going to use some verses in 1 Kings. Go to 1 Kings chapter uh, 16 will be our first verse. Uh, we're not going to read a lot of them, but this is another instance where God's uh, people need to turn back to Him. And it takes a miracle from God. But I want to emphasize in Peter's instance, it was people praying. It was intercessory prayer that got the results that they were looking for, even greater results than they thought could happen or would happen. So let's go to, if you will, go to 1 Kings and let's look at a few verses. We're going to look at Kings uh, 16, 17, and 18. And don't get excited. I'm not going to read all those verses. But I'm going to read a few just to point out uh, what was going on and what happened here. It's a very familiar story. It involves Ahab and Elijah. And uh, you've heard it preached many times if you've been in church very long. But Ahab's a wicked king, an evil king. We're going to pick up in uh, 1 Kings chapter 16, the last few verses. Uh, well, let's look at verse 33, 16, 33. Now, let's, let's go back to 29. I'll read a few verses. Uh, 16, verse 29. And in the thirty and eighth year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Amri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Amri, reigned over Israel in Samaria twenty and two years. And Ahab, the son of Amri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. He did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all the kings of Israel that were before him. He was a wicked, wicked person. Then we pick up with Elijah coming on the scene in chapter 17, verse 1. It says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Ahab is wicked. Uh, the Lord is trying to get Israel's attention. The people have gone to worship in Baal under this king, this wicked king. So they're following him. Elijah comes along and he says there's going to be a drought. It's going to be for a long period of time. And God tells him, you tell Ahab this is what's going to happen. And he did. And then the next part of the chapter, uh, we know uh, God sent Elijah to a certain place, to a brook. He was going to feed him and take care of him there, and the brook dried up. Then he moved him to another place where he met the widow. You remember the widow? And he says she had just enough meal for her and her son for a last meal because the famine was so great there was no food, no water meant the crops weren't growing. So there was no food. So remember he told her, uh, take what little you have and go and prepare me a meal. And uh, had I been the woman, I would have thought to myself, surely you're jesting, buddy. I'm going to take my last meal for my son and me and make it for you instead. But she did, and God blessed. And then we want to pick up uh, in verse 1 of chapter 18. 
remember this, the child died and God brought him back to life. Chapter 18, verse 1 says, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. So it hadn't rained for over three years. Uh, no food, very little water. And so it's time for uh, Elijah to go tell Ahab, okay, I'm going to send some rain. But in the meantime, there's this guy named Obadiah. and uh, He was the governor of Ahab's house, and he had hidden some prophets. Remember, he hid a hundred prophets because uh, Ahab was killing all the prophets of God, but he hid a uh, hundred prophets by fifties in two different caves and he fed them, actually he fed them off of <laughs> Ahab's table and gave them food and water. And so as Elijah's on his way to find Ahab, he meets Obadiah. And this, look in verse 7 of chapter 18. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him and he knew him and fell on his face and said, Art thou that, my lord, Elijah? And he answered him, I am. Go tell thy lord, behold, Elijah is here. And he said, What? Have I sinned that thou wouldst deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? Uh, Ahab hated Elijah because of what he prophesied. Ahab had taken Obadiah and he said, Let's go search through our land and see if we can find food and water for that we might save the animals and everything until we get rain. And so he meets Elijah on the way, and Elijah says, Go tell Ahab I need to see him. I'm here. He said, no, Are you serious? He hates you. Why would you send me to tell him that? But he does. Um, and then verse 17, it says, And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. And so the story goes on. Uh, you remember Elijah's challenge. He's going to challenge the prophets of Baal uh, about who could talk to the Lord and, and God would do what they ask him to do. And uh, remember they built an altar and they put the bullets and things on the altar and the prophets of Baal prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and uh, nothing happened. God didn't hear their prayer. And so then Elijah takes and builds an altar and puts the bullets around it and then he pours water all around him and everything and he calls on the Lord to bring fire down from heaven. And God does it just like that. Uh, he answers his prayer. And so why would God listen to a prophet, a one-man prophet like that? Because he was a godly man. He was a righteous man. He was a man who followed God's commandments. He was a man of God. And when nobody else would speak up, he was the lone person who would defy Ahab. <clears throat> and he was able to pray to God and get an answer to prayer immediately. And when the people saw that, they realized that we've been following the wrong person. So the people turned back to God. And we see that over and over again in the Old Testament where people, uh, the Israelites, got away from God and then he had to do something to bring them back to him. And that's what he did in this situation. But the thing I want you to see here is it is prayer that brought it back. God hears prayer. He answers prayer. I want us to look at one more verse. If you will, turn over to James chapter 5. Now, sum this up really quick. One of my favorite verses, one of my, <laughs> my very favorite book in the Bible is James. I love the way he uh, lays things out. He doesn't mince words. It's just boom, boom, boom. Uh, he's telling the Christian, this is how you're supposed to be living. Well, in chapter 5 here, <clears throat> there's a specific verse I want us to look at. Three verses, really. Let's 
pick up in verse 16. James chapter 5, verse 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias, or Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man. You know, when God looks down at us, He sees one of His children or not one of His children. When He looks at us who have been saved, those of us who have asked Christ to come into our heart and save us, <clears throat> He sees a righteous person, not our righteousness, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We've been clothed with the righteousness of Jesus because of what He did for us at Calvary. And so, this phrase here, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We've looked at two situations, two stories in God's Word where prayer is important. The effectual prayer. Uh, praying specifically. The group at Mary's house prayed specifically for Peter. For God's deliverance for Peter. Elijah prayed specifically to God. They prayed fervently, without any doubt, without any uh, uh, concern that God would not hear their prayer. We have the uh, wonderful opportunity, uh, Hebrews tells us, of coming boldly before the throne of grace, that we can find mercy and help in time of need. If there's ever been a time in the history of America, a country that God founded, God sent His people to bring this uh, place, America, about, sent the right people, godly people. He wants us to come to Him in prayer. He wants us to use the tools that we have. We've been talking in some of our last lessons about uh, stewarding our lives. And we talk about stewarding uh, everything from our finances to last week. To, we talked about our testimony. God gives us tools. He gives us resources to use that we can steward our lives, that we can manage them. Our lives are not our own. They belong to God. He gives us life. He sustains life. We belong to Him. We're just overseers of what He's given us. We're also overseers. We should look at ourselves as overseers of this country that God's given us. And we need to understand we need to do our part to steward our country also. One of the tools He's given us is prayer. Uh, when that temple veil was rent from top to bottom, it meant that we didn't have to go to a priest to send our prayers to God. We could go directly to Him. What a wonderful opportunity. What a wonderful, powerful resource we have. Prayer is the most powerful thing we can do. It's a tool God's given us. Not only to steward our lives, to manage it, but to be able to help others steward their lives. You know, it's not about one person. It's not about one group. It's all about God's people and God Himself. That should be our focus in our life. As we steward our lives, as we steward our testimony, our resources, our finances, our country, one of the ways we do it, one of the tools we use is prayer. So, a question to you today. Do you think it's time that we should come together in prayer? Prayer that God would restore our country. Prayer that God would end this virus. Prayer that God would uh, do away with all these riots and things like that, that we can get people back on the right track. We know uh, one of our responsibilities is to give the gospel. 
the major way that we can change our country is to give the gospel and see people saved and then see them discipled. Discipling is one of the things that's lacked in the last 50 to 75 years in churches. <clears throat> and it's, it's Christians that didn't do it. But we can get back to it. That's another resource we have, another tool we have. We have to grow a new generation. The generation that's coming up right now, if we're not careful, is a lost generation. There's still time because God is God. He can work miracles. But I think we need to understand that it's time for some fervent, passionate, without ceasing prayer. Are you willing to do your part? Are you doing your part? Am I doing my part? It's time to pray. And I, my prayer today is that we will all recognize that as Christians and we'll do what we're supposed to do. So I challenge you today. Take a look at your prayer life. Is your prayer all about me, me, me and what God can do for me? There needs to be some intercessory prayer in there for others, for our loved ones, for our class, for our church members, for our families, for our country. Don't just say, oh, my prayer doesn't mean anything. It does. It will. It can. If we'll do it without ceasing, we'll do it fervently. It's our choice. It's our responsibility. Father, thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for the stories, the history in your book, the examples, the illustrations, the parables that you use to teach us. Help us to understand that everything in your word can be a teachable moment. It should be a teachable time for us. That's why it's so important. Lord, help us to understand how important it is to spend time in your word how important it is to spend time in prayer, not only for our fellowship with you, for our relationship with you, but Lord, for our relationship with others, for our country, for our friends, for our families. Help us to be intercessors. Help us to be willing, Lord, to spend the time that it takes. And oh God, please hear our prayers. Please touch the heart of every Christian in this country, every Christian in our church. Lord, that we would begin to pray that we can see you work a miracle. God, you can do it. You want to do it. And you will do it. If we, your people, will do our part. If we'll turn our hearts totally back to you, we can see our country saved. We can see our uh, country turned back to where you want it to be, to where we can truly once again be a Christian nation. You've been so good to us. You've blessed us in so many ways. Lord, help us not to be lazy. Help us not to uh, just want to uh, pass the buck to other people, but help each one of us have a great desire in our heart to learn to pray without ceasing to pray fervently for those things that we need to see happen today because you alone hear our prayers. You alone answer our prayers. We know that you will. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being so good to us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for giving us a way to get to heaven. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.